Brock Lesnar isn't gone from WWE. AEW set to release footage of CM Punk's all-in altercation. And my review of WrestleMania XL Night 1, Part B, forward slash, Amendment 69. A big thank you to Wrestling Masterclass for sponsoring this episode. Check them out using the link in the video description below. I'm Ollie Davis, and this is the Wrestle Talk News. Support Wrestle Talk! Yes, I know, I know. It's the review special of the biggest WrestleMania of all time, and Ollie Davis is starting with the CM Punk story. I am now my own meme. You might not have seen it with all four hours, 20 minutes, or 20 marijuana of WrestleMania 49-1, but AEW Collision also took place on Saturday evening, where FTR beat Top Flight to advance to the Tag Team Tournament Final. Penta took on Commander in a very good match, and... The Young Bucks announced they'll play the backstage footage of the incident that led to Punk's AEW firing with cause. To catch you up, after a rocky year of backstage tension, Tony Khan decided to fire Punk from AEW following last August's All In London show. This is because Punk allegedly had a backstage altercation with Jack Perry, which led to Khan fearing for his life. At the time, it was reported one of the deciding bits of evidence was CCTV footage of the incident, providing a far more objective view than the he said, she said all out brawl from the previous year. But the Bucks are corporate heels right now. Surely it'll just end up with them playing some spoof version of the videotape with them doing bad MC junk impressions. Apparently not, according to everyone. Dave Meltzer, Brian Alvarez and Sean Ross Sapp have all reported that this is not a bait and switch angle. Tony Khan actually intends on playing the Punk Perry footage on Wednesday's episode of Dynamite. Perry hasn't been seen on TV since that incident, so it's possible this sets up his return. Punk, meanwhile, returned to WWE in November and seems to have reignited tensions with AEW in his Ariel Hawani interview last Monday, where he gave his version of events, claiming he was acting responsibly in that incident. Also, another one just before I get into the WrestleMania review, Triple H answered a question about Brock Lesnar's WWE status at the post-Mania press conference. At one point, there was a conversation with Brock about Royal Rumble, but a long time ago. Right now, Brock is home being Brock, and we'll see where that leads to from here. His status is the same as it's been before. Brock is not gone from WWE. He's just home being Brock. Lesnar was widely reported to be making his WWE return in January's Royal Rumble match, where he would then set up a feud with Dominic Mysterio to potentially then go on to face Gunther at WrestleMania. This was pulled when he was seemingly referenced in Janelle Grant's lawsuit against Vince McMahon. He was also removed from WWE's opening Sting and the WWE 2K24 video game. Now all that news is done, it's WrestleMania, baby! Woo! It's a big show impression. It's actually an impression of Cody Rhodes doing a Big Show impression. WrestleMania 40 Night 1 wasn't just the beginning of Mania Weekend, it was also seemingly the officially recognised beginning of WWE's new era. The broadcast debuted a new then now forever together sting, with the superstars depicted in star constellations and Triple H doing all the voiceover. It had a new ending bumper, with Triple H doing all the voiceover, and the show itself opened with Triple H coming down to the ring and welcoming us to the new era guess we could call it the Triple H era. Just like the Attitude Era, which kind of started with Austin's 316 promo at King of the Ring 1996, but wasn't officially recognised with the Scratch logo debut over a year later at Survivor Series 97, after taking creative control in July 2022, we're now officially in the Triple H era of WWE. So of course Rhea Ripley retained in the first match. Spiky Jacket, Triple H check. Live band for her entrance, Triple H check. Even longer title reign, Triple H triple check. She fought Becky Lynch in a really good opener, going back and forth, where Lynch targeted Ripley's left arm for her disarmor submission. It was a classic story of working over the body part, and one both women executed without ever making either of them too sympathetic over the other men didn't mind who won, because you were rooting for both of them. Ripley's power and resilience versus Becky's strategy and experience. But Rhea blocked a manhandle slam, hit a riptide into the top turnbuckle, and then another in the middle of the ring to win. Ripley is still the champion, and I think that's the right call. She's so hot right now, and it feels like she's got a lot more momentum 
with the belt. After a fun recap skit with Pretty Deadly running down all the competitors, next came the six-way ladder match for two different sets of tag titles. That's six teams, or 12 guys fighting for two sets of championships, or four belts. Which means each competitor has an eight and a third percent chance, but you times that by the four belts and... Oh dear God, no. I'm not saying that number! I'm not saying it! While the action was fun, there was too much visual clutter for me in this match. It was always like the most crowded part of the Royal Rumble. DIY's DX entrance was great. There were many good ladder or table bumps, but not many that we haven't seen before, and a genuinely heartwarming overall story. Where well, R-Truth unhooked the Raw Tag Team Championships at the end, giving him his first ever win at WrestleMania, and the awesome Truth's first ever tag title run. While in theory had unhooked the SmackDown belts earlier, kind of unceremoniously, with the sun now set, it was time for the real stars to come out. No, not the Latino division, some football players. Rey Mysterio and Andrade versus Santos Escobar and Dominic Mysterio was presented really well. There's the long-running father-son feud, a long-running mentor-protege feud, and there's Andrade. With all the respective factions at ringside, this felt like it belonged on the Mania card, even though it wasn't for any championships or was a concentrated singles blood feud. The actual match, though, was more of 10 minutes of fun spots to set up gratuitous celebrity involvement. Two huge luchador men stopped Dom from getting a steel chair, helping Ray and Andrade pick up the win. For the mystery guys to reveal themselves as the Philadelphia Eagles, Lane Johnson and Jason Kelsey, neither of whom a Taylor Swift's boyfriend. Thank you for the literally hundreds of people who corrected me about that on Friday's news episode. Following a local sports team pop, Philadelphia then got a local... Uh, thematic tagline pop, as Jay and Jimmy Uso finally fought one-on-one -on -one in the city of brotherly love. Everything makes sense on paper. Two people, brothers, who have spent their entire lives together. One betrays the other, and now they must fight. It's a tale of biblical proportions. Cain and Abel. Cain and The Undertaker. But just like those Brothers of Destruction matches, as I predicted, the Usos in-ring match never really clicked with me. Some of that is because I don't often get into these kinds of matches. I never cared about the Hardys facing each other either outside of the broken universe. And even then that was massively tongue in cheek. And the rest of it because this match only got 11 minutes. A story 38 years in the making was the joint second shortest of the show. It was about five minutes of super kicks, which the crowd got into when it was yay boo, or should I say, Jay boo. But then Jay started to look conflicted. So when Jimmy started begging for forgiveness, Jay embraced his brother to the crowd booing. It's because we all knew what was coming. Jimmy betrayed him again, making Jay look dumb. But Jay overcame him shortly after, barely an inconvenience, with a spear and a splash. This needed more time, a longer heat period, or maybe even an appearance from their dad Rikishi to make that emotional section really sing. The shortest match of the card, though, goes to Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair's in-ring segment, also known as the trios match of Belair, Cargill, and Naomi's here too, against Damage Control. Barely lasting eight minutes, this was all about showcasing Cargill, which they did a great job of, and foreshadowing an eventual match against Belair, at the expense of the women's tag team champions. Cargill got the pin. My match of the night, however, was the brilliant Gunther versus Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental Championship. It had the story, title, and characters I'm most invested in, and Sami's single tracking shot from backstage to his entrance, where his wife and kid wished him well, for his trainer Chad Gable to say he's not going out there with him because he can do this alone. The Sammy embracing Kevin Owens just before he entered Gorilla meant the match already started an emotional 11. Zayn is one of the most natural drawers of wrestling empathy I've ever experienced, which made it even more heart crushing when Gunther chopped him and booted him and clotheslined him and powerbombed him and splashed him, each one feeling like Sammy was down and out. But Gunther trash talked Sammy's wife at ringside one too many times. Sammy powered up, hit a brain buster on the top rope, a halluva kick to the back of Gunther's head, and another one to the front to get the win. Even Samantha Irving couldn't control her emotions when she announced the winner. An end to a historic reign which will only elevate Gunther into the world title picture, and now will hopefully start a great run for Sammy with the belt. The Roar and Smack down general managers announced the attendance figure at 72,543. But what's the turnstile number? And we got to see all the celebrities in the crowd. 
including Wale. Must have been incredibly confused by that Usos match. Just before I get on to the main event, I want to say a big thank you to this video's sponsor, The Wrestling Masterclass. Ever dreamt of breaking into the professional wrestling business as a wrestler, promoter, booker, commentator, referee, journalist, podcaster, YouTube star, or another key role? Wrestling Masterclass is a historic online course featuring over 70 HD video lessons, podcasts, and seminars with some of the world's top wrestling experts, both in the ring and behind the scenes, including Will Ospreay, Raven, Dutch Mantel, Doug Williams, Mike Kyoda, and so many more. Start your journey today at WrestlingMasterclass.com. And then it was time for the main event, with all the R's. Roman and Rock versus Rhodes and Rollins. With an hour 20 left of the show, most of which was for The Rock's entrance. It was actually an hour for the match, which was 44 minutes. The second longest WrestleMania match of all time after Brett vs. Sean at 96. No matter how long you think Roman vs. Triple H actually went. It was perfectly building sports entertainment with twists and turns and smoke and mirrors. The Rock plays his final boss character almost too well. At one point he punched Seth right in the dick in plain view of the referee, prompting the ref to apologize to Cody because he can't do anything about it. The Rock is his boss's boss. It did mean though that mostly everyone just wanted to see Cody and The Rock interact, with their moments getting by far the biggest reactions which somewhat undermines the actual main event for night two. Reigns and Cody did have some great sequences when they did wrestle, though Roman's nose got legit busted open, Seth's assistant stomp into a crossroads was a great near fall until Rock pulled out the referee. Multiple times I actually thought and was legit rooting for the baby faces actually winning, even though that wouldn't have made the best story for night two. I also thought Roman accidentally spearing the Rock would make the bloodline combust, but it never seemed to cause any issues for now. And it fed into an amazingly chaotic Cody reversed rock bottom on rock through the announcer's table. And Seth getting speared by Roman through the timekeeper's area. Still one of my favourite spots in wrestling. Rock looks really great in this match. But with Rollins incapacitated, the numbers game overcame Cody. Which for once didn't involve Solo Sokoa. A third crossroads on Reigns was stopped by the rock whipping his back, letting Roman hit a spear. And then the rock reached out for a tag. Almost as though he now has the most authority in the bloodline. And Reigns tagged him in. Could that be an acknowledgement? That Roman acquiesced to The Rock's demand to finish the match. A rock bottom and people's elbow gave Rock the pin on Cody, setting up an awesome Infinity War style cliffhanger for night two. While the camera work expertly captured Cody's sad face with the bloodline in the background, a direct mirror of his loss at the end of Mania 39. WrestleMania 40 night one is 90%. With The Rock winning on the first night of the Triple H era, watch my documentary on their crazily mirrored careers and real-life backstage tension in Feud Forever. 